boots with no safety gear. He uses nothing but his bare hands. Fine. I read somewhere if you fall over 50 feet you're, and you land flat or something, let's say that your organs, set, that's when they start separating, tearing apart from each other inside your body. So after that, I guess you're pretty much, you have a real good chance of dying after 50 feet. When John Bakar climbs, he literally suspends his life from his fingertips. You can usually find him 200 feet above the valley floor of Yosemite National Park, where the vertical granite walls provide the world's best climbing. This is what John lives for. This is where he belongs. No ropes, no pitons, just hands, shoes, and a bag of chalk for grip. To the other climbers, John just may be the best free climber that ever lived. This is free soloing. The climb is called Crack a go, go and John does it better than anyone else. In fact, no one else will even try it without ropes. Think of it, nothing to hold you to the sheer face of the rock other than the power of your own grip. When John climbs, there's usually no one there to admire his flawless technique, and no one there to help him if he's in trouble. He started climbing at the age of 14 with ropes, but four years later decided to go it alone. It's a, it's a big step to start free soloing. You take away the rope and it's, uh, it's really serious. You have, to know, you have to have a lot of confidence in your ability and be able to read the rock real well. And uh, you just don't jump into it, you know. John and his wife Brenda live right here at Yosemite, where she works at the Park Hotel while John climbs for a living. He's totally committed to the sport, and even though she knows the many dangers involved, Brenda can't change anything. She's never told you that I want you to do this for another year or two and then retire, or shouldn't be doing this rock or that route? Or... No, she hasn't. But I made it clear to her that all I'm doing every day is, is going to climb, you know. If he stops, it's because uh, he wants to stop. Whenever he finds his limits. The key to free solo climbing is fitness. You can't afford to get tired 200 feet up a wall. Your life literally depends on your physical condition. And John devotes several hours a day just to working out, improving his strength, perfecting his balance. And it's taken me a long time to develop what I do in a workout. I've got it refined to a specific routine where I'm, you know, I'm doing certain things to get certain results. How important are your fingers to what you do? Uh, that's a real important part of the climber's workout is developing his finger strength because a lot of times that's all you have from the rock, you know, just a couple square inches of your fingers. What separates John from the other climbers is technique. His moves are smooth, calculated, effortless. The place to develop this is on the many boulders scattered throughout the park. When John does it, he always attracts a crowd. Everybody has to ask you if you have any consciousness or fear of heights at all. Sure. I mean, if you know if you're way off the ground and you fall, you're going to die, so you're afraid of that. But if you're strapped into the rock and you look down, you, you know, it doesn't really do anything to me because I know I'm not going to fall. In Europe, rock climbing is even bigger, and John is a superstar there. But here in America, climbs like this go relatively unnoticed. That hasn't discouraged him. This is what he lives for. To him, it goes deeper than just wanting to be noticed. It's a way of life. And as far as he's concerned, a long and healthy one. I'm going to climb for the rest of my life. Are you sure about that? Yeah. You don't right. think there's a, there's, there's a limit? I'm not getting tired of it. No, I like it. It's a, it's a healthy activity. to help him keep his grip. John Backer is considered to be the best solo free climber in the world. Let's join him as he prepares for an incredible rock climbing challenge. John Backer spends long hours every day keeping his body in top physical condition. 
he must rely on brute strength and extraordinary skill to take him to the top. John has turned his garage into a simulated mountainside so he can practice some of his more difficult rock climbing moves. This 35 foot boulder is John's training ground. He mentally and physically prepares himself for his major climbs by limbering up on this small slab of stone. solo free climb only five years ago and he has since dedicated his life to being the best i climb on the average 300 days a year probably only taking one or two days off a week joshua tree national monument in california is a wonderland of rocks today john will attempt to climb two rocks each rated as extremely difficult Remember, John will use no ropes or safety gear. Only an expert like John should ever attempt such a dangerous climb. He has chalk on his hands to reduce the sweat and lessen the chance of losing his grip. John's first challenge is a 50-foot cliff. He must literally walk upside down on the cliff's granite ceiling in order to get to the top. Ceiling, but he's not out of danger. He is now entering one of the most treacherous parts of the climb. The crack running up the side of the rock is only half an inch thick, barely enough room for John's fingertips. completes the first of his two climbs and takes a moment to savor his victory. Now it's on to a much tougher challenge. John will attempt to climb the most dangerous rock ever to be scaled without the use of ropes. This rock is known to climbers as Leave it to Beaver. Because of its sharp angles and severe slope, it has rarely been climbed. towers more than 70 feet above the desert floor. It will be the ultimate test of John's free climbing skills. For the first half of the climb, a fine crack in the rock will serve as John's lifeline. Every move he makes must be very carefully calculated and thought out. The slightest mistake could easily cost John his life. John has now made it halfway up the rock and reached a very critical point in his climb. He no longer has any long cracks to guide his hands and feet. The cracks on the mountain are too small to even accept his fingertips. John is truly at the mercy of the mountain. He must move onto the smooth face of the rock and rely on any wrinkles, bumps, or ledges he can find to complete this almost impossible climb.
Whitaker has completed this incredible climb and proven once again that he's king of the mountain. is really important when you think that they're going to be up on that rock wall for hours and hours and hours and they can really get fatigued. Well, they've built a little outdoor gym here. Let's take a look at Ron and Jerry in their workout. New training methods have pushed people to new accomplishments in many sports, and certainly that is the case in rock climbing. Even to pull-ups with Ron using only his fingertips. Everything in this Yosemite gym is a customized maneuver to simulate those encountered on today's climb. Climbing didn't used to have the athletic drilling and conditioning we're watching now, and the results are new achievements never thought possible several years ago. Ron and Jerry have spent at least one hour each day here for the past four months. Here, the ability to balance and concentrate, shifting from one foot to the next, essential for a climb the magnitude of Lost Arrow Spire. This called a crack machine, and simulates the cracks on a rock wall. Fists and feet are jammed into it, just as they are doing now, to aid in their ascent. Yeah. When many of us think of rock climbing, we think of a summer activity. Not so for Ron and Jerry. It's a year-round sport, oh, and they pursue it throughout the world. When Lost Arrow Spire was actually climbed in 1947, it took two men five days and many artificial aids. They probably couldn't imagine then a spot in the valley where this training would be a daily affair. After the gym, the reward is this activity called bouldering. For the climbers, it's relaxation. It also helps polish techniques. It helps to increase finger strength. It's sort of like well, a golfer going to a driving range. And to top things off, a relaxing run to develop cardiovascular conditioning. And it contemplates the huge granite walls rising up from the valley. We're back in peaceful Yosemite. Here's a lovely June afternoon scene, like an English tea party. But up here on the rock, something else is going on. And that's intense training paying off now because these two youngsters are... with anybody else but now now the sport is entered into mainstream sports per se and, and it's more of an application of athletics uh, a good exposure is, is looked on as a good thing because it can do nothing but but good things good things for the sport and the people involved and in addition uh, this production is, has employed half of the half of the local <laughs> local climbers so so I don't think anybody's gonna be complaining much a little money never hurt right No. climbers I guess uh, traditionally don't have a lot of money well simply by virtue of the fact that it takes it takes all their time to get to a world-class standard to, to do these, uh, to do the more interesting climbs like Lustro. And because of that, uh, there's, there's precious little time for a job. Okay, the climber is getting ready now for that uh, last uh, shot. And the lifestyle of uh, climbers, I think, is somewhat interesting. We've had a chance to see a lot of that this week. Let's take a little look. It's springtime in Yosemite Park and the camp is full. This message board is the main link to the outside world. It also serves as a want ad connection for climbing gear or just a ride home. But this isn't just any camp, it's called Camp Four. There probably isn't a top rock climber in the world who hasn't passed through it. To them, Camp 4 is a famous place. <laughs> Life moves slowly, and there's a lot of talking it over. But why are they here? People come all of, from all over the world to do the big walls of Yosemite. There's nothing else like it on Earth. You got perfect weather, 3,000-foot walls. Uh, any place else you go, you're going to have to fight the, the freezing cold and the rain. But this, you have perfect weather. It's a perfect environment for rock climbing. The valley's famous in Australia for, for the excellent uh, long routes that they have to climb here, the walls, and particularly for the crack climbing, which is quite unique. We come from Norway to climb solid rock in nice weather, big walls. Gear has to be placed out of reach because climbers aren't the only ones who visit Camp 4. There are hungry squirrels and an occasional bear. 
Those who visit have saved all their money just to get here. They live on about a dollar a day, even picking up empty cans for five cents each. And they come from all over the world. I come from Garmisch Partenkirchen. Sweden. Colombia. Wyoming. Of all places. Switzerland. Los Angeles. Okay, back now with the climb and the climbers. 22-year-old Jerry Moffat from England and John Long from, really, who has lived here in Yosemite for many years. Both campers have been literally camping right here in the valley for several months now, getting ready for this climb. John Long with me and our climber Ron Kout, 27-year-old, up on the hill, up on the mountain. Looks like Bobby's he's ready to tackle the most difficult section coming up right here. Vertical, smooth, bereft of, of any decent foothold, foot or handholds. He's really going to have his hands, okay, yeah. hands full here considering yeah. he's already put in 26 plus hours of climbing to get to this point. I was going to say, fatigue must come into play. Yeah, it certainly does. As you can see, oh, oh, I, I actually see this okay. Jerry that's on the yeah. lead now. He's, 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 uh, he's moved up the left, yeah, left hand side of the solitary legend. In just a moment, he's going to step right into climbing in earnest. You know, this is an awesome sight for uh, someone who is not a climber like myself. And I'm sure many of our viewers. How about the? Uh, how about this vertical drop up there? I would think that this would be uh, would really be scary. It is for me. Does it bother the it's climbers like at all? Yeah, it's it's always there. sort of electronic spook. You're right. You can just uh, a fact that everybody has to deal hold. with. Okay, let's listen to the climbers for just a minute here. Jerry Moffat is uh, taking the lead right now. At 22, really one of the top uh, free climbers in the world. Yeah, he certainly is, Bob. He took to it early at 16, and uh, he had the, the physical and mental right, attributes right. to be able to excel. Good. Good. That in conjunction with the fanatical concentration and dedication has, has put him right at the forefront of world, the world rock climbing. Talking to him earlier this week, though, he told me that he had never climbed a rock anywhere near this uh, <laughs> this long, mostly shorter ones. Okay, so here we are at Lost Arrow, reaching the final face here, the spectacular Yosemite Park. We'll be back with more. Back live at Yosemite Park, this is Jack Whitaker along with George Willig, and you're looking at young Jerry Moffat, spread eagle there, almost. Reach for it. There he it leads is. the next pitch, and terribly, terribly exposed here. Uh, I dare say this is the most exposed <laughs> section of the climb, Jack. But incidentally, if uh, the viewers don't know, a pitch is a rope length. It is where climbers go from one anchor point to another. Okay. Now from above, you see Ron is still back on the ledge. Got it. As Jerry takes the lead on this pitch. Just air below. That's right, and the rumbling of the waterfalls. Well, this is so out there. He's moved out left on the ledge. Outrageous! Uh, yeah. I couldn't even believe it. You know? It's pretty neat. I think they're enjoying themselves. This is very tenuous climbing here. Once again, those ropes to the left are. The ropes for the cameraman. What's it like over there? It's trying to talk. Look at that. He's really got to reach. Okay, you got it. My arms were only another two <gasps> inches long. All right, now he's clipping a piece of protection in. Of course, uh, Every once in a while, that's done to uh, lessen the length of a possible fall. The fall, of course, will stop you from 
killing yourself, but you can still get hurt quite a bit hanging against the wall. Uh, it's possible, but usually something like that would happen when you hit a ledge, so it's important to put protection in often enough you know, when you're near a ledge so that that doesn't happen. This is what he's doing here. Exactly. Getting pumped up at all? Yeah. This boat looks hard. Maybe if you can high step that knob or do something like that, I don't know. Yeah, maybe a low end there. Yeah. Try to lie back. From here it looks like that. It's hard to see. Ooh. Briefly saw him over the edge there. There he is. Something. I think he's gonna be going about straight up from there. We said this was probably the most strenuous part. You can you see why. You just have to go for it, Jerry, before you burn out, I think. Oh, he's hanging out on his arms. It's very steep. And Ron said he better go for it. Just crank it off. Crank it off. There he goes. Hands and feet. Oops. Needless to say, there isn't an overabundance of hand and Fine. foothold. Yes. You're start again, huh? Yeah. yeah. It was what you might call a probe. <laughs> yes. It's incredible. He's up there just by his hands and feet. He's go for that move. That's right. What about the mantle? I don't know. Looks like it's best from here to high step it. Yeah. Just crank off with your fingertips. I'm just gonna get up a little bit. See if I can rest better. I'm trying to pull up. Very difficult spot, this, huh? Undoubtedly. <laughs> Makes my hands sweat I'm watching. I'm going to put it on my left. I'm going to put it on my left and my right hand on the top. Could be. Looks like if you just hang off with your left hand, reach up with your right, I mean, uh, the other way around, reach up with your left, make a high step. Some advice from Ron Kalk? Yeah, it's, it's very, very common. We're going to get pumped up. Climbers to help each other. Oh, it's terrible. Huh? It's boat really sticking out. Jerry Moffat. Jerry Moffat has hands like hooks. He can really hang on for a while, I tell you. Jeez. That's it. There he goes. He's gonna make it. Crank it, Jer. There you go. Go on, get it up there. Power it out. He's almost at a spot where he can rest. <laughs> Cheerleading there by okay. Ron Kalk. Got slack. Right. Oh, you've heard some reference All to right. pumping up, by the way. Pumping Great. up is when your arms just get really oh, yeah. tired and they actually get pumped up with blood because of all the work. I can't even you're doing. believe it. And you're losing strength when that happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was just my own arm. I just I thought it was going to pop. <laughs> I put my foot up and I'm like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> I put my foot up a and candid I'm moment for sure. Yeah. Right Seems Ooh, happy great. enough. A little exhilaration. Yeah, great. More to come though. Sure in terms of difficulties. <laughs> my thing is kind of good. Okay. All right. Oh, man. Let a yawn. We've been out here too long, I think. Looks like he's looking for a piece of protection to put in. Fifteenth round coming up. <laughs> it has been a long two days. Yes, it has. Now from below, you see Ron, you see Jerry, and then you see our cameraman. 
and blue sky. Space, air. A lot of exhilaration and exercise going on here. Here's the goal, the top, the summit. See, as, as a climber is moving up, it's quite strenuous uh, to be stopping to put in protection, but of course it's necessary. Jerry's rather a bold leader. Sometimes he's willing to move a little higher up without uh, protecting quite as often as some other climbers might. But he knows what he's doing. Well, he has to, or he wouldn't live to be 22 doing this, would he? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Each climber has to make his own judgment call as to when uh, is a good time to protect and how strong he feels mm -hmm. and such. I think you're almost to the blade, Jer. Yeah, just go for it. Because he's moved so much laterally as well as up uh, in somewhat of a zigzag fashion, he may have some rope drag. It may be different, difficult for him to pull the rope up that he's, uh, he's attached to. Yeah. Those buildings down below, Yosemite Village, so you have some idea how far up these young men are. Having gotten there by the strength of their hands and their feet. Yeah, Mr. Moffat is traveling now, isn't he? Okay. Maybe the belay, yes. Okay. Got the belay spots. So he'll be setting some anchors. Can we get stood up here? <clears throat> and right here, he'll stop and belay Mr. Ron Kalk up to this point. It's a little tricky. I'm just slip up backwards. Well, on this beautiful Ooh. June day here in Yosemite Park, this free climb on Lost Arrows Fire will continue, and we'll be back in just a moment. Bob Beatty with John Long back at Yosemite Park. Reaching now for the summit. 22-year-old Jerry Moffat and 27-year-old Ron Kalk. Lost Arrow Spire. Thing is killing me. Listening now to the climbers. It's been a long hey. day. Looking okay. at Jerry Moffat. It is. Okay. You ready for it? Yeah. It's good Got through a carabiner? They're hauling up their equipment bag. John, how about this last little pitch? It'll probably be Ron Kalk. He's sort of the captain of the team. Yeah, indeed he is. Uh, one thing is, even the exception... ...free climb, ascending without the aid of mechanical devices. Bennett... In California's Yosemite Valley, granite peaks stand like sentinels, guarding a passage into a world of risk. Climbers come to challenge these stark monuments, which were formed by a glacier 15,000 years ago. The greatest monument in the valley is El Capitan, a rock wall that rises to a place where silence is a language. Vertical and absolute, El Capitan is an exercise in dizziness. A pebble dropped from the summit would fall almost to the ground without touching the rock face. There's not an easy step anywhere on El Capitan. I'm your host, Kurt Gowdy, with a remarkable story of three mountaineers and their daring effort to free climb El Capitan. With permission from the National Park Service, they will undertake this unusual climb. 26-year-old Ron Kauk, Yosemite Valley resident, has been climbing since he was a boy. This free solo on Yosemite Falls was part of his training program for El Capitan. Free climbing stresses hand strength. 31-year-old Werner Braun has spent over half his life in the mountains. Although he's functionally deaf, his balance and his equilibrium are superb. Beverly Johnson from Wyoming has climbed on mountains all over the world. At 34, she's one of the best female mountaineers at work today. Developing finger strength is the most important physical exercise for the climbers as they move into the final months of preparation. More than a quest for the summit, this team seeks to free climb in a style that no other group of professionals could match. 
El Capitan was first conquered on an aided climb in 1958. Here, Werner and Ron demonstrate the techniques of aided climbing, hanging by ropes and pounding mechanical devices into the rock to help them ascend. El Capitan has a reputation of being the toughest rock face in North America. Imagine a team of climbers trying to scale El Capitan without the aid of these devices. That's exactly what Ron Kalk and his partners will attempt to do by free climbing the rock face. In this practice session, Ron free climbs by relying solely on finger and arm strength to pull him up. Beyond the presence of a safety rope, no other ropes or mechanical devices will be used. Ron's hands are so strong that he has been known in the climbing world as atomic fingers. Earlier this year, the climbers came to El Capitan. They had decided that a winter assault would be best to reduce the sweat and slip on their hands. Also, the cool air would keep the granite at a reasonable temperature, not too hot to the touch. Down this rack is driving me nuts. <laughs> You're lucky. You're lucky you don't hear these kind of things. For the next few days, the climbers will inhabit a private, vertical world, living by the strength of their hands. Special climbing shoes are tight-fitting and soft, with sticky rubber soles. This is the second time that a team has attempted to free climb El Capitan. The climbers face three major obstacles. The traverse above the sickle ledge at 750 feet, the flake traverse at 1,400 feet, and the great roof at 2,000 feet. The summit stands at 3,593 feet. We join the team at the 575-foot level as Werner Braun leads the pitch in an effort to save Ron's atomic fingers for the more demanding work that lies ahead. You must be feeling pretty good today. Going good. Hey, Werner, smile! This is a real long trip, right? Yeah, it's a long trip. It wants me good here, okay? I got you. Let's go for it. Look like you just I got this little edge up here. Got it. Fell <laughs> 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 so right into it. <laughs> Above the sickle ledge at 750 feet, the climbers face a dilemma. The crack system that had provided finger and toe holes to this first ledge suddenly ends. They have to move laterally to find another seam in the wall, which means a pendulum swing on the end of a rope. The technique is acceptable as the climbers don't gain any altitude by swinging across to a new crack system. Whoa, ow! Ah! You're gonna have to dive for it. I know. Don't wear yourself out. No. Then you miss. You got to turn in a hurry or it's all over. Go for it. Diving. Maybe. You got it? Yeah, I got it. All right. Good job. Climbing. And now I presume if I fall out, what I do is flatten myself on the rock and hope the terry cloth. Will yeah, well, let me know what you're doing so I can feed you slack. I don't want to be the one to pull you off. Okay, pull it up. Working on the new crack system, Beverly up. shows the patience and ingenuity needed for a long climb. Soon after her lateral movement on the rope, 
Ron Kaup crossed the same section of rock by free climbing, an effort that removed any over. doubt about a violation yeah, of the free climb over. rules. Does it look all right above you? Yeah. Well, this is really Ron's climb. Um, Werner and I are just up here for the view. Well, not really for the view, because we do a lot of the pitches, and that makes it easier on Ron. By climbing these, these pitches that aren't so difficult, we let Ron save himself for the stuff that really is on the edge. I mean, he's probably the only person in the world that could do those pitches, the real hard ones. You got some good protection in? Yeah, I've got some anchors. Okay, Ron, I'm off. Okay, great, good job. Well, I don't know, I'm not even sure this is a stance. Linked by a single rope and the desire to reach the summit, the climber's fate is in their fingertips. The wintry heights of Yosemite Valley in the Sierra Nevada mountains offer a hundred impressive peaks. And yet for grandeur and difficulty of climbing, none of them compares to El Capitan, the world's largest monolith. On this mountain, a team has free climbed to establish their current position 1,330 feet above the valley floor. Beverly Johnson drew Mars up the safety rope, bringing gear for the second day's work. This thing about 150 foot. It is very cold in the rock face in the early morning, and the climbers need to stretch their hands and feet before they can begin. Gymnastic chalk reduces the moisture on their hands and lets them grip the rock. Looks great. That means it looks scary. This morning's challenge is the flake traverse at 1,400 feet. Werner will try it first. There you go. Yeah, pull up on it. Okay, foot up to the other edge. Other edge. Left foot. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Up, huh? I missed the fall. I couldn't see it. It's this further down. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I'm pretty, I'm pretty tired. Well, you can come back and rest and try it again, or I'll try it. I don't care. You want to try it? About 80 pounds of equipment need to travel with the team. Here comes the new Dan. And for the moment, Beverly Johnson gets the workhorse chore. Now, Ron will try to surmount the flake traverse, which takes its name from the cornflake texture of the bumpy granite. Since his hands are often above his head and drained of blood, Ron tries to improve the circulation in them. Warner. Warner. You all rigged up? You got your ears on? Yeah. I can see what I gotta do. I just gotta make sure I got the strength to do it. Okay, I got it, Warner. 
I'm at the belay. That's gonna be about all we can do today. We can bivy here. All right. Okay. With the difficult, bumpy granite of the flake traversed behind them, the team bivouacks for the night by suspending collapsible cots from the rock wall. I said, I'll handle the cooking, huh? Although most of us wouldn't get much sleep in this position, hanging 1,425 feet off the ground, the climbers have no choice. Stiff-limbed and fatigued, they prepare for a chilly night during which the temperature will drop to 20 degrees. For all of them, the summit still seems far away. As dusk comes to El Capitan, the climbers begin to understand the overwhelming proportions of the task that they have set for themselves. The sound of popping corn ends the day. Already this team of climbers has surpassed the other free climb expedition on El Capitan. Reviewing their achievements so far, they have found a route over the sickle ledge and traversed to a new crack system, which Ron Kauk accomplished on a daring free climb. Ron also led the way over the flake traverse at 1,400 feet. And now fatigue must be considered a factor as the team's efforts have taken a toll on their reserves of energy. Their third morning on El Capitan is bright and clear. Though their hands are stiff and burned with pain, none of them looks down. Their hopes are lifted up toward the next obstacle, the Great Roof, a narrow ledge that no other free climbing team has ever conquered. At this point, the summit is hardly the goal of the climb. Rather, the careful application of each team member's skills as they prepare to move step by step over this treacherous section of granite. Hey man, are your hands warming up? They look pretty cold, though. They're stiff. They were, they were stiff, huh? Yeah. Sometimes my hands, they get real cold like that, and I can't get them warm. You must have bad circulation I do. Or Arthritis. Can't, I don't know how I could have got it. <laughs> With a flurry of chalk dust, Ron Cock readies his hands for the most demanding work they have ever done on a mountain. We got everything we need. The narrowing of the rock wall makes the task increasingly difficult. Hey, Warner. There's some slippery moss up here. It's wet. So if I can keep three points on the rock, maybe I won't slip. I have to make a reach, though. So. Watch the rope. Careful. Some tiny face holds out here. All right. My hands are really stiff. Yeah, the big edge out on the right. Oh, okay. There's a fixed pin up here. All right. Pins from a dozen different aided climbs have been left in the rock face and come as a welcome surprise to the free climbers. Oh, man, looking down is too much. <laughs> I think I'll just keep looking up, so listen if you can. <laughs> The edge is really sharp up here. Whoa. Hang on, man. <laughs> ah! Hey, be 
careful. Are you okay? Oh, I cut my finger. It's bleeding. It's gonna make it a lot harder. It's slippery. Keep an eye on me. Take it easy, okay? What you do is go. Yeah. And you get no hands rough. Yeah, right. Uh huh. God. Yeah, I don't know if my hands. I'm getting too pumped up. I got you. My fingers can't take it. It's ripping me up. I'll give it some more. Hang in there, man. I mean, just go for it. Oh. That's about it for me, Warner. It just took everything I got just to get to here. I know what it takes, but I just don't got it yet. Unable to go beyond the 1,900-foot level, Ron's frustration expresses the team's disappointment. The traditional measure of mountaineering success, the summit, remains untouched. And yet this climb had more than traditional goals. For three days, the team executed daring and exhausting maneuvers, using only the body strength that they had developed during the long months of preparation. They're gone. I ain't got nothing left. The team's innovative work on El Capitan has set the new measure for free climbing achievement while pushing the limits of this demanding sport to a new boundary. It's just too hard for us up there. Uh, it's gonna take a lot more training to get up that. The six British climbers, accompanied by expert climbing cameramen, brought us what might be considered today primitive black and white pictures of this daring feat. We also introduce you to the bird life that inhabited this remote and beautiful area. Birds with the unfamiliar names of skuas and foamers, and the nasty habit they had of defending themselves. One keeps wondering whether one's going to meet a foamer on the way, because they use these ledges, and they got a nasty habit of sticking on you if you put their head over the edge. Of yeah. whatting on you? Pardon? Of whatting on you? Sicking. This is their... Being sick on you? Yeah. This is their defensive mechanism. And um, as soon as you get anywhere close, they just, um, well, are sick. And they're surprisingly accurate, actually. They direct it in a kind of a mass of evil-smelling liquid straight at your face. Several years later, Wide World of Sports attempted the first live telecast of a rock climb by the man who gained fame and notoriety climbing New York's World Trade Center, George Willett. This time, our cameras accompanied him as he climbed a rock formation known as the Bastille in El Dorado Springs, Colorado. Next, we went with Bullock and his climbing partner, Steve Matus, to Angel's Landing, a sheer 900-foot rock face in Zion National Park, Utah. The rock wall proved less than angelic, though, when on the second day of a live two-day telecast, George faced one of the more dramatic moments of his climbing career. Oh, my God. George, are you all right? Yep. You okay, George? Yep. You sure? 
Yep. Hang on for a second. Check yourself. <clears throat> Don't even try to talk. You just knocked the wind out of me. Just, just hang there for a minute, George. Yeah, I'm fine. Wide World, Matus and Willig next journey to Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming. The imposing monolith, which had gained fame in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Then it was on to Castle Rock in Castle Valley, Utah. A dangerous sandstone formation which created treacherous hand and footholds for Willick and Matus as they ascended high above the desert floor. Five years later, it was Yosemite National Park in California to a place called Lost Arrow Spire. And we first met a man named Ron Kalk, considered by many to be amongst the finest rock climbers in the world, and his climbing partner, Jerry Moffat. As the waters of Yosemite Falls thundered in their ears, we watched in awe as they conquered that imposing rock face that had to be thought of as yet another example of nature's impressive handiwork. It seems hard to believe that it has been nearly 20 years since our first coverage of rock climbing at the Old Man of Hoy in the Stone Age of black and white TV. Much has changed in those years, but the rock and beauty have not. And so it seems time once again to return to this lonesome structure and let it bear yet another challenge to its steep and crumbly face. Today, Ron Kauk, accompanied by Britain's Nicky Wright, will reintroduce us to the old man, to the land it belongs to, to the people of that land, and oh yes, to its unique and defensive bird colonies. It all unfolds today on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Perhaps the words written by the 19th century Orkney poet Malcolm best describe this incredible scene. See Hoy's old man, whose summit bare pierces the dark blue fields of air. Based in the sea, his fearful form glooms like the spirit of the storm. The old man of Hoy rises as an inspiration. Great Britain's most famous sea stack proudly guards the coast of the Orkney Islands as the sea beats against its red sandstone in a tireless rhythm. Looking at a map of Europe, we can locate the British Isles. Off the northern coast of Scotland lie a group of islands called the Orkneys. The Orkneys consist of 70 windswept islands, only 20 of which are inhabited. Years ago, the old man of Hoy was attached to one of those islands, the island of Hoy. Years of ferocious pounding finally took its toll, and now the old man stands alone. At 450 feet is the tallest and perhaps most impressive needle in Britain. Pretty spectacular, isn't it? Hard to keep a straight face and call this a job. It's really just a privilege to be out here. It is that beautiful. Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Biadid. Climbing the old man of Hoy today, Ron Kalk, 29-year-old from Yosemite, California. Ron is considered one of the top rock climbers in the world. Joining him, climbing with him for the very first time, 23-year-old Nikki Wright. She's from Great Britain, living in North Wales. Working with me today, renowned author of many mountain climbing books, John Berry. John has also climbed the Matterhorn and the North Face of the Eiger. Pretty great feats. John, how about this rock climb? Well, it's a, it's a big climb, 450 feet straight out of the sea. Serious, crumbly sandstone, not the firmest, not the friendliest of rock. Uh, wild birds around, wild weather, <laughs> wild whiskey. Speaking of the weather, one of the Scottish friends that we met a couple of days ago said, hmm, you can see four seasons in a day, laddie. How about the weather here? Uh, it's pretty grim. Uh, we're a long way north. Uh, it rains a lot. It never really gets very warm. So it's, it's not the friendliest of weather. And that weather does something to the rock. Yeah, it could be a problem. If it rains, for instance, the, the rock will become very greasy. There's a lot of lichen on the rock. It'll become slippery. Uh, wet rock's not, not good to climb on in any case, and this is sandy wet rock, so it'll be slimy, greasy, not, not, not as friendly as you'd wish. Okay, John, it should be uh, quite a climb. How about my Scottish accent? What do you think? I think it's appalling. <laughs> it's appalling. Right now, the weather is absolutely beautiful, although there are some showers forecast for later in the afternoon. You never know here in the Orkneys anyway. Ron Kalk, looking at the rock yesterday, was very impressed by the difference between the granite, the solid granite in Yosemite, and the brittle sandstone right here. Great, I'm off. Okay. 
One thing we might want to mention is that you will see other people on the rock. Those are riggers. Those are our camera people, Bev Johnson and Mike Hoover. They have put their riggings up earlier. They're both outstanding climbers in their own right, but don't be confused because they are hanging from those riggings. Sometimes people say, hey, how can people climb this? It's not that difficult. People are up there with, with cameras on. Well, it is difficult, and those riggers really know what they're doing. Each climber will lead on what is called a pitch. This time it is Nikki, and she will be putting some protection into the rock. She's doing that right now. I might say that this protection is not to aid in the upward movement of the climb itself. This is only protection in case they should fall. We'll put some gear in here. So I'll extend it. People sometimes refer to this type of climbing as gymnastic climbing, and we can see why. The, the moves that Nikki Wright is making as she goes up here, I mean, are really agile. For those of you youngsters watching right now, this isn't something you want to go out and just try by yourself. Make sure that you get the proper type of training. It's a wonderful, wonderful activity, but don't do it without the right kind of instruction. Sounds like she might have run into some trouble there. Oh, it's one of the foamers. Oh, oh the okay, foamer good. vomited right on her. I made it. Good luck to you. I got something for him. And a boy, Nikki Wright climbing with Ron Kalk, and they've already received a taste of the treacherous behavior of birds called fulmers. Don't you dare. You take some sympathy on me now. I told you, I have my precautions. I plucked this out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Looks like they're as preoccupied with the fulmers as they are with the climb. They probably end up going over to the right here, eh? Yeah, around the corner. Yeah. And they're both at the end of the first pitch, about 70 feet up. Both of these climbers have interesting approaches to their sport. Do you want your coat? I have it in the pack. Yeah? Yes, please. They come from worlds apart, separated by more than 6,000 miles. From different cultures. His home, the back of a pickup truck in the lush mountains of Yosemite, California. She, a university graduate student from the rural beauty of North Wales. But they share a passion for rock climbing, which bridges everything. What do you think of it so far? And makes the conversation between a climber from California and a climber from Wales that much easier. Just the two of us. We can make it if we try. Never having met previously, they arrived on this remote island just five days before the climb from their two worlds as different as their training methods. Uh, the training I've been doing for climbing is mostly fingertip exercises. I'll build uh, apparatuses that you climb up in your fingers maybe for 20 feet, come down, back up and down. Uh, traversing on bits of rock to pump up your arms for endurance, stretching for flexibility. I don't do a lot of training. I tend to get bored in the gyms. 
Um, I do a lot of cycle riding, more out of necessity than a, than a real hobby. Um, anything in the outdoors. I couldn't stay indoors for a minute. <laughs> and if they differ on training methods, they agree on a total respect for their common pursuit. I'm frightened most of the time when I'm rock climbing. And I think that's exhilarating. That's what I enjoy about it. Well, to overcome the fear, I think I just talk myself through it really slowly and carefully. But uh, most times if you're really gripped, you get grip on with your hands so tight that you won't come off. I think, uh, yeah, there's going to be times for anybody, any climber, or whatever you do, if you're in a dangerous situation, that your fear will arise. But what happens is you learn to control it, work with it, know your equipment, know your partners. Well, they haven't had much time working on their partnership, just climbing around here the last couple of days. And now it's Ron's time to uh, lead on this pitch. John, why don't you describe the traverse that Ron's going through right now? Well, it's, uh, it's an, an airy and exposed position. Traverses are always serious because uh, it's serious for the leader and also for the second, the, the, the person coming second. If you haven't got the rope directly above you, uh, as you would if you were following on a normal pitch. So you've got to take life fairly steady on traverses. Why don't you describe the role of the leader and the role of the person who is behind? Well, the leader uh, establishes the route, gets himself up it, gets the protection in. Uh, the second's job is to, is to get up it competently and quickly and, and recover the equipment that the leader may have used to protect himself or herself while he, was, he or she were climbing. Um, usually what will happen is they'll swing, ro swing rolls, swing leads. Um, so you're a leader one minute and the second the next, or you're a leader one pitch and the second the next pitch. I'm not sure if that's what they're going to do this time. Um, so maybe we'll see Nicky leading uh, and swinging the leads with Ron. Ron's, to... Ron's coming up to probably one of the harder moves on the climb now. You can see he's just got into that niche. He's got to swing up so he's into the crack above. There's a little roof above him, a little overhang, or actually quite a big overhang. And it's quite tricky. You can see he's strung out there on the on the face now, fairly exposed position, nothing but beneath his feet. 100 feet of fresh air in the sea. He's looking cool. Once again, the protection that he's putting in now is only to aid in case he falls, but not in the climb itself. gives a pretty good look at the rock here. It's been a particular concern, as we mentioned earlier, to Ron, because it's unlike the rock that he's used to climbing in Yosemite, which is really hard, pure granite, very solid rock. This is a sandstone. It's very brittle. And there's been a lot of rain here the last few days, and it's made it very slippery, particularly with the moss that's inside the cracks. Coming up shortly, the most difficult part of the climb, called the crux. It's like a spider working his way up this mountain. It's almost like a, in a way, like a chess player planning every move. There's the crux right here. using his whole body to wedge into the into the crack here. John, why don't you describe the process in picking the route? Okay, well, <clears throat> what's happened here is the line that Ron's going to take is reasonably obvious. I mean, that is to Ron, because he's on it. Uh, and basically, he's following that crack that runs vertically above his head. So he, he'll have come out of the niche uh, through that overhang, and judging by the grunts, had a little bit of a, a struggle there, not too big a one. I think he probably enjoyed it, though. Uh, and now he's going to follow the crack, which uh, he's got his right hand and his right leg in. 
uh, all the way up for about another 50, 60 feet till he comes to those ledges when he's going to be able to take a rest. So at the moment, he's progressing on j hand jams, jamming his hands and jamming his feet into that crack, scrunching them up so they um, swell in size and, and jam, and then pulling up on, on those hand holes. I was interested two years ago out in Yosemite to look at a training rock called Midnight Lightning in camp number four. And you know, Ron Kalk is one of the few people who could actually climb this rock. Very agile climber. And Ron's nearing the end of the second pitch, almost halfway up. The old man of Hoy. I hope you don't mind piss jams, Nikki. Cliffs of St. John's Head. Here in the Orkney Islands of the northern tip of Scotland. Where Ron Kalk and Nicky Wright are climbing this sea stack right here. The old man of Hoy. Nicky starting the second pitch following Ron Kalk. John, why don't you describe this move that Nikki's uh, coming up on right now? Well, you can see what she's doing. She's traversing horizontally across towards that crack that uh, Ron's already gone up. Uh, what it means to her is that because the rope runs from her waist horizontally across to the crack, if she was unlucky enough to fall off now, she'd take a huge pendulum, maybe 20, 30 feet uh, downwards, and also, of course, way out to the, uh, way out to the Orkney somewhere. Um, <laughs> Now, that's not Ron's fault. Ron will have tried to put in protection on that traverse, but he probably just couldn't find any. And this is one of the problems of seconding on serious climbs such as this, where you, you may have traverse moves. Once again, we should mention that the ropes are used only for protection, but not to aid in the climbing. The climbing is free climb. Why did she move down, John? Well, she would have moved down there because that would have been the natural, easiest line on that particular piece of rock. Um, and there's no point in life ma making life more difficult than it need be. Uh, so that happened to be the way. You can take it in the sack, Ron. Climbs usually go up, but uh, there's nothing to say they shouldn't occasionally go down, too. Sometimes you go down a bit quicker than you want when you fall off. You know, we all have uh, various degrees of fear of height. I have a tremendous one myself. <laughs> what about the what about the uh, feeling for height out there? This well, awesome. um, you're on a skyscraper, aren't you? You're on a high-rise building, um, a natural one. Uh, it's more frightening on a on a single monolithic pillar like that than it would be uh, at the equivalent height on maybe just an ordinary rock face. So yeah, height's something that will be um, concentrating their minds fairly considerably at the moment. Do rock climbers like Ron and Nicky, uh, do they have a fear of height or, or, uh, or do they like the rest of us? Yeah, I think everyone, if you haven't got a fear of heights, you're mad, you're crazy, there's something seriously wrong with you. Everyone's got a fear of heights. I think the difference between climbers and maybe the rest of the world is that climbers have learned to control it, learned to rationalize it, and learned when they need be frightened and when they needn't be frightened. And that's probably the big difference between people who climb and spend a lot of time um, at altitude at heights and, and people who don't. And working her way carefully, and I might say gracefully, up the old man of Hoyt, Nikki has just about reached the second pitch. Hundred and fifty feet. Not as high as the Empire State Building or the Eiffel Tower, but taller than the Statue of Liberty. Not to get out of that corner. And on this hundred and fifty foot sea stack, Nikki has reached Ron at the end of the second pitch. Are you cold? Do you get pretty well warmed up? No, I got pretty warmed up. Let's look back at an interesting scene while the climbers were scouting the rock earlier. There's another bird here, Nikki. What did the last one do first? Oh, God, it keeps on me. Right away? Yeah. Keep in mind that this is the breeding season for the foamers. Hey. I'm going to try to scare them off a little bit. And Ron right, came prepared. Right 
Well, his rubber snake <laughs> didn't do snake any good. We didn't have any snakes in the British Isles, run. So much for the snake. Well, I got a little something else. I could try. I'd like to get him away from the lead before I set anchor here. But now, the final weapon. Ron happened to bring along his water pistol. Come on. But even that didn't seem to He's make not really much of a reacting. difference. Maybe we can be friends then. Share this ledge. I think it'll be okay, Nikki. Just a matter of communication. Oh, yes. Can't come on too strong. Oh, Here, clean your mouth out. <laughs> Nikki took a different approach. What's he trying to get him with the snake? No snakes in front. Can't go good. Are you at the bird? The bird's all right. Starting the next to last pitch, Ron and Nikki are nearly halfway up the old man of Hoy. Oh, no, With the sun behind the rock, the temperature really does dive here. And Nikki has put on her jacket as she leads this pitch. Nikki, is the rock uh, loose there now? No, it's getting a little bit better, but it's still this mud in layers in between. Is that hard to, is it slippery? The muddy bits are, yeah. I'm getting into the green stuff again. It's all lighter on, on the rock. It's like a house slip off. Maybe you could... Describe the moves that you're doing right now. I'm stepping up onto a, another large ledge. Not that there's no birds here. Uh, my fingers are getting on some good little nobbles on the edges, but they never they might just be really pliable. Oh, I just slipped. No birds. Hey, Nikki, it's John here. Hello, John. Come on, tell us you're enjoying yourself. Yeah, it's fabulous. <laughs> That's great to hear. We've got another good piece of protection here, which is nice to see. Yeah, it makes us feel happier, too. There's not much here at all. Once again, the other ropes that we see there are the ropes used as riggings by our cameraman. The, the waves are really banging in below. Can you hear them and can you see them? See what, sorry? Can you, uh, can you see the ground below? Can you hear those waves banging in on the rock? Yeah, add to the atmosphere. Oh, there's a puffin. Yeah. 
right where I put my hand. And Nikki just keeps smiling away. I'm there. not sure the birds like her presence here. It's got an egg. Now it's Ron's turn to follow on the third pitch. Inspecting the rock and listening to some rock of a different kind on his headphones. Pretty cool move, 300 feet straight up. We're expecting some showers here late this afternoon, but none have materialized as yet. Anyone going to the Orkney Islands must realize that the life on the island is ruled by the weather. Some say Orkney has nine months of winter and three months of bad weather. Well, it's a beautiful day here today. Little is known of the Orkney Islands, and many look upon them as a collection of rocks, either uninhabitable or inhabited by a race of men untamed as the seals, which play upon their shores. But they are really a beautiful, beautiful place. We ourselves knew little of the Orkney Islands before coming here. But it is really beautiful here. The Orkneys have a greater density of ancient monuments than any other place in northern Europe, including this natural one. The old man of Hoy. Calc and Nikki Wright are working their way up the sea stack, and right now Ron is leading the final pitch to the summit. Ron, how does this last pitch look? Okay, I got the right spot now, I think, Bob. It's up the corner. I was thinking go out on the outside wall. There's a good track system up the corner. I noticed an old fixed teton up there. I didn't see it first. That's good, nigga. The rock's pretty nice up here. What kind of rock are we looking at? Is it, is, is it as brittle as some of the earlier rock? No, it's not. It's much more sound. It's great. Kind of nice for me. Oh, I see a lot of stuff right up above. It's nice. John, uh, rock climbing like this, fatigue starts to set in. Yes, I don't think Ron will be uh, a man of Ron's capabilities of prowess on rock. I don't think he'll be tired, at least not physically. He might be a little bit mentally tired from the um, sort of psychological pressures and uh, some of the dangers that aren't physical, like stonefall, sea, the weather. I think he'll still be in good shape. I, th I still think he'll be enjoying himself enormously at this last bit, bit here. They've been living off the nerves for three hours now or something, so that'll be having some effect, thank you. Once again, for all of you young people out there, if you would like to go out and try some rock climbing, make sure that you get the proper type of instruction and the proper kind of training. Just don't go out and do it by yourself. And as the climbers work their way up the rock, and with less than 100 feet to go, we'll be back later for the final assault. Old man of war. Climbers have been lured into a dangerous challenge. Besides the harsh northern climate, there is the constant distraction of the sea moving and crashing beneath. But to Henry Barber, a 23-year-old climber from America, this is just like his New England home. I happen to like sea cliff climbing more than almost any other climbing. Basically, I love the ocean and I love the mountains, and I, I've always lived in an atmosphere where I could enjoy both. Henry Barber is in Wales on a climbing holiday, testing the limits of his skill on the coarse sea cliffs for all the roots of strange poetic names, like Dream of White Horses, Liberator, and this narrow crack up a crumbling vertical wall called Strand. 
Strand has been climbed by teams with ropes, but never alone without ropes or aids. Soloed, as climbers say. Although Strand's unique position was one of the lures that drew Henry to England, there were other enticements. Britain has many excellent climbers, and therein lies another kind of excitement. Climbing with the best in your field is another way of finding out how good you are. And so before attempting Strand, Henry went to Cornwall to climb a route called Liberator with an Englishman, Pete Livesey, a top caver, kayaker, and climber. A heavyweight, just like Henry. And though the climb required them to be tied together, one leading, then the other, underneath the surface, beneath the laughter and good cheer, a fierce competition rages. Now, meet Pete Livesey. About halfway up is a little overhang to negotiate. Under this is a pin that's normally used for aid. In fact, nobody has yet done it without the aid. And of course, I'll have to try and do it without the aid because if I don't, um, Henry certainly will. It's a kind of a, a competition again. But as I am leading, if I opt to use the aid and Henry does it without, then I feel as though he's beaten me. The trick here is to sneak off right around the corner, around the erect, onto a little hidden ledge and it's possible to take a rest here. If things get too difficult, you always think at the back of your mind, I can get out of here, I can jump in the sea, and that's it, I'll, I'll be free. Of course, it's not true. You wouldn't have much chance of getting out of the sea. But it, it just seems to be there. It's a psychological thing, I'm sure. I move back left around the corner, to the pin. I had a couple of attempts at climbing the move free, but in the end, my face and eyes were covered in sweat, my hands were covered in sweat, chalk was everywhere, and I just gave in, grabbed hold of the pin, and used it to pull up and move over the roof. It's kind of a, a psychological relief when you grab hold of it and it's there and it's firm. But a couple of seconds later, you know that you've given in, that you've lost that particular part of the competition. And you know sure as sure that Henry will do it free. On the other hand, he won't be leading. He'll be on the other end of the rope. And this makes it a lot easier. And you can kind of console yourself with that thought when he's powering over the roof. But perhaps another day, I'll do it without. Henry's coming up now, and he's climbing very fast, which is a bit annoying, because we'd like him to have difficulty on it. Because he knows that, and he's climbing as fast as possible. Climbing is an extension of walking. You always have to be concentrating on your, your footwork, even when you're going over an overhang. You want to take as much strain off your arms as possible, and this is done by using your feet. And if you can get one hand over the lip of the overhang and then get a foot over, you're immediately taking strain off the other parts of your body. He's probably bummed out that I did the roof move without the aid, but yeah, that's really his problem. It probably has to do with the English climber's grabbiness for first ascents. And for me, that's really not what climbing's all about. See you soon. Yeah, yeah. It's Henry's turn to lead the last pitch now. It's very steep, and each move is quite strenuous. But if you climb very fast and forget about protection, then it's a very easy pitch to do. It's certainly a very easy pitch to, to second. Henry's climbing it, and he's spending a tremendous long time hung under the roof above the stance, trying to get some protection in. I'm sure I couldn't spend that long hanging there, but Henry's strong. There's a good, there's a good protection placement above him. I know it's there, but I'm not going to tell him, because he, he seems to want to hang there under the roof, using up all his strength. In a situation like this, you have a crack in the back of a corner and use a technique called laybacking where you pull with your hands in the crack and push with your feet against the slab. 
to reduce the strain on your arms and leg muscles. After the difficult layback and overhang section in the last pitch of the Liberator, you still have to be careful because the climbing eases up quite a bit, but after you've done difficult climbing on a, a route of this nature, you can very easily make mistakes on easier ground when your runners are further apart. You could fall a long way. And once you've reached the end of the pitch, all you have to do is belay your second up, the climb's over. I remember when Henry Barber first came over here to climb, he set out to impress the British climbers. And I'm sure they would have done, but he reckoned without the great beer drinking tradition of British climbers. It is considered unsportsmanlike to go out climbing without having drunk vast quantities of beer beforehand. Henry wasn't into beer drinking at the time, but I think he's been training since then. We notice the difference now. He's come back here and he can drink the beer as well as climb. Competition moves off the cliffs and into the local pub. The spirit is still one of fierce, friendly sport. Here, getting the worst of it at arm wrestling is Al Harris, an Englishman who's a close friend of Henry Barber's. In the morning, they plan to climb a route called Dream of White Horses. But in true British climbing fashion, the night before is spent in revelry. Dream of White Horses. That's what the rock climbers call this route in Wales. Henry Barber climbed it before and is familiar with Dream, but this morning mist will alter everything. The route is a horizontal traverse and is being led by Al Harris. We went to do Dream of White Horses. I'd heard about this route for years. I'd never done it before. And although everybody praised it, it was supposed to be one of the classic routes in uh, North Wales. The Climbing was supposed to be not too hard, but in sensational position, really exposed and very frightening. I didn't foresee too much difficulty, so therefore, when I found the first pitch hard, it rather surprised me. Uh, I set off on the first pitch, and there was a big line of holes leading up, looking really easy, uh, over to the left in the general direction of where I was going. So I started up climbing up there. There was no definite spike, so I couldn't get any protection on. Uh, Henry shouted up that he thought I was perhaps going a bit too high. He'd done it some time before and seemed to remember it going lower than where I was. But it seemed the obvious line to me, so I continued on up, getting myself further and further out into a frightening position. A fall would have resulted in rather bad consequences, a really long way. I would have fallen something like 100 feet at that point. It looks harder lower down. It looks harder lower. It's not easy. It's a 50 foot run out there without any protection. And there's still no sign of any runners. No, oh, there's, there's good runners about 20 feet below you. Well, you mean I'm in the wrong place? I don't think I went there. <coughs> oh, man, it's a frightening place. Come on. It's starting to rain, you know. I want a runner. I'd like to do this in the rain. Is there no running on this pitch? Yes, there are. Where? I don't know. I want one. <laughs> it's very good to have competition in climbing where Al and myself say are fooling around, laughing. Huh? He's gripped, and I say, oh, it's no problem. So what if you fall 30 feet? But that's, that's a friendly competition, and friendly competition spurs one person on to do moves that otherwise he wouldn't be able to do if there was just a blob sitting on the other end of the rope playing. It became obvious that Al picked the wrong line. It was in a really difficult spot. He found some small cracks and put in some poor protection. He was relatively safe there, but he was still stuck in the middle of nowhere. And he was trying to figure out a way to 
get to this large crack at the end of the pitch. You can find a move hard, and the fear builds up in you as you do that move. The strength drains out your fingers, you get frightened, which draws your strength off again, and so then the whole thing becomes much more serious, and it can build up very quickly like that. So you have to remain completely calm and calculating throughout, and any fear that rises in you, you have to control and cut off. Oh! oh. Nearly! Okay, let's try this. Desperate. Ah! Hooray! A crack. So of any sport that involves fear and risk gives me a, a buzz from it. I get a buzz from it, that's all. <laughs> the more you climb, the more you get used to the vertical environment, the moving on rock, and eventually it becomes like walking down the street. The time has come. The decision has been made. Henry Barber will attempt a solo climb the crack wall called Strand. When he took his climbing holiday to Britain, this sheer cliff 600 feet above the ocean with its treacherously loose surface was in his thoughts. Henry Barber is a good climber, but this challenge is truly on the edge of his ability. This is not a safe climb. On hand are a few English climbers, and on the right, our guide, Al Harris. This climb, this strand, starts from a 55 degree grass slope with ferns and heather growing on it, which falls some three to four hundred feet down to the rocks and the sea below. Once you've gone above about a thirty foot level on the vertical rock above the grass, any fall would be fatal, because the speed you hit the grass would continue to bounce down it. It would be far too great to effect any breaking. Usually when hard climbs are soloed, the person who's soloing them does them on a rope beforehand so that he can be sure of the moves and know that he is technically capable of getting up it. In this case, Henry's never done the climb before, so he's soloing on sight, as climbers say. But he's never been soloed before, let alone on sight. He's doing a very strenuous lie back move now, putting his foot up really high, and he's going to pull up onto that foot and thereby gain some three or four feet in one move. Nicely done, Henry. Once you've started generally soloing, then it's very hard to stop and come back. You set your mind on the target, you condition yourself, and you climb like a machine, or you try to climb like a machine, without any emotional stress and things coming into it, which are only dangerous influences which uh, make it more dangerous. You can't overcome fear by saying that this is high and this is low and this is safe and this is not. You can only overcome fear by being very cruel and calculating in all your maneuvers. In other words, every move that you do, you have to be able to down climb. Every single step you take, you have to be convinced that you can make it back down. A very hard move, which could be easier, but you do the harder move because it's easier to stretch down from the hold, the foothold to the handhold. Soloing is a, a very personal thing, and it's very hard to share it with anybody because it's very selfish. There's a lot at stake. It's not really your life that you're giving away. You're not playing it for you. You're playing it for everybody. You're playing it for your girlfriend. You're playing it for your parents. You're playing it, in my case, for my parents, who have made it possible for me to, to climb and do what I do. In solo climbing, you have to overcome a great number of odds whether it be strength, whether it be too much strength the night before, whether it be a subconscious feeling 
So you're thinking about all these different things, and maybe the looseness of rock, or maybe bees, maybe it's bee season, or maybe it's lichen on the root, or maybe it's dirt, or maybe it's birds, or maybe there's swallows in the cracks in El Dorado, or maybe it's seagulls in these sea cliff climbs. And you think about all these things, and you have to get them all straight and in order. You have to douse all these real feelings about your family, about your friends, about the people that are watching you. I mean, it, what gives you the right to go out and kill yourself in front of 20 people or whatever? Anyone who pitches for a living. The next few moves can be flying by partially hand jamming in the crack. Some small finger jams and some part of your hand goes in. You do this by pushing your hand in and then try to make a clenched fist against the sides of the crack, which uh, acts as quite a good handhold. He must be getting very tired now. He continuously uses his arms. Can't really rest much there, though, because it's so steep. The heat up there must be incredible. It's a white face and it reflects the sun. It's like a, a big mirror drawing the sun in. Sun trap. You can see the sweat glistening on his legs with sweating so much. Now he'll be able to lean on his right hand and rest his left hand. And then he'll put his left hand and then lean back and rest his right hand until his arms come back to full strength again or near enough. And then he'll feel confident enough to move on. He's got some 20 feet of 25 feet of hard climbing to do now and uh, then he's safe. But it is the steepest part of the climb, and if he's used a lot of his energy already, which he's bound to have done, then it makes it uh, very hard. You're continually hanging on your hands and your fingertips and uh, having to do strenuous pull-ups. He's not got very good hand-holds there. Ah, oh, that's better. He's got a better position now. He's got his left foot on a much better hold. Oh, oh far it off, baby. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. He's doing another one of these long pull-ups, these long lie-back moves. Seems to be the character of the climb that you have to continuously do these as the only holds are in the crack. It must be incredibly hot up there. He's sweating profusely. Having to continually dip his hand and tilt back to maximize the friction of his fingers on these small holds. When he leaves this position now, he will not be able to rest for the next 20 feet, so he'll have to do continuous moving. Working out each move as he moves. Here he goes. He's reaching up into that hole. There's a reasonable hold in there, which you can use to the utmost. Oh, man, his leg's shaking. He's going down. That didn't look very nice at all. It's extremely unstable. Gotta get his, some strength back to do these last moves. He can only rest one arm at a time though because it's so steep, so he's hanging completely on one arm while he rests the other one. Ah, he's moving up now. Ah, he's got it better this time. Yes, nice move, Henry. Yes. Only one more move and he can reach some good holds on the top. He's very dirty there though. There's lots of um, sandy stuff in the cracks. It makes it hard to grip properly. One more move, Henry. I know you're tired, but one more move. There he goes. Get your left hand up for that good hold. That's it, that's it. Yes, nice. Very bold solo. The 
last part is big holds, well spaced, not too bad, and it became very hard because I knew it would be easy. And because I wasted the strength or used up the strength earlier on in the climb, this became very hard. Flowers are beautiful on this moss and stuff that you've got to climb, but you can make a mistake by grabbing a bush that's not solid. You can make a mistake by standing on some moss that's a little bit wet and might break away, whereas if it was dry, it might be a good foothold. You, you can walk up through beautiful meadows at the top, which is nice, but what you really want to do is just get off that rock, get onto those meadows, and just stroll away. And maybe look at seagulls, maybe look at seals, maybe look at cliffs, but really get into why you're soloing in the first place. If you're soloing for freedom, you're soloing for a freeness of movement, and you're soloing perhaps to be alone. Once you've done a number of solo ascents like this on site, the only thing you can have left in soloing is to solo easier routes to enjoy yourself, to get this rhythm going, maybe like doing an, a dance exercise. And I had rhythm in Dream White Horses. Everything was together. In England, the climbers are still talking about the American conquering strand. But to Henry Barber, his fondest memory was of Dream of White Horses, a solo ballet performed on a tilted stage. I really enjoyed the rock. I really enjoyed the moves, the variety of footholds, slanting, downslopey, good finger holds, layback holds, jam holds. Everything was there. So on Dream, I had it all together. It was beautiful. Great rock here, Andy. This was good last time, wasn't it? The mist and everything gave this climb a certain aura, a feeling, an atmosphere, a mood. And this is the same mood or feeling or atmosphere that you get when you go to a museum and you look at a certain painting. And every time you go back to that museum, you'll probably go back to this painting because it's something that you really see something in, you really enjoy. solo because you're going for the ultimate. You're going for the ultimate rhythm. And if you can walk well up and down stairs, if you can skate well, if you can ski well, if you can drive a car well through S-turns, if you can do anything well and do it with the best motion, the, the finest line, the most rhythmic feeling, and get all these things working together, then you've accomplished it. You, you've made it. This is doing the ultimate thing you can do. And this is what soloing is. And to piece a rhythm together, to piece totally uninhibited, unstructured, and totally free set of moves, set of circumstances together, which soloing is. It's not just climbing, it's, it's, the, it's the life.
Each of us discovers inside ourselves abilities that can lead us to excellence. But we must steadfastly pursue that which we do well, and thereby we master ourselves and our world.